Kristen, welcome to LSAT Unplugged. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for joining us. So I've really been excited to speak with you for a while now. I understand you're working in admissions at UC Davis Law, correct? Correct. And can you share a little bit about with us about what you do there? Sure. Uh, so I'm the Assistant Dean for Admissions and Financial Aid here at UC Davis School of Law. We're also known as King Hall, uh, named after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, so here at the law school, I oversee um, all of the JD uh, admissions process, as well as financial aid for incoming students and financial aid for uh, all of our current students. Well, excellent. Wow. So you're really running the gamut. Yeah, absolutely. Everything except for our LLMs. Right, right. Awesome. Okay. So What's the average process, you know, when an applicant hits me on their application, what's happening behind the scenes once you receive it? Sure. Um, so here at Davis, we use um, a two-tiered review process. The first step, uh, every single application, every complete application, um, is read by a member of our admissions team. So myself or two, I have two directors. We read all of the files um, amongst the three of us. Uh, we then make a proposed decision. So we propose admitting, we propose deny, we propose waitlist. Uh, and then the file goes on to an admissions committee. Our admissions committee is six people. Um, it changes every year, uh, the membership, and so it is always comprised of four faculty members and three third-year law students. Uh, so they review uh, the file, they see our recommendation, um, they can, any one member of the committee can say, I disagree, and we, uh, and the committee will discuss the file further. Um, if there's no objections to the proposed decision, it becomes the final decision, uh, and then that's when we send out um, the decision to the applicant. So um, the process is good because it means applicants, a lot of different perspectives, look at the file before it becomes, uh, a decision becomes final. Um, the downside, of course, that does take us sometimes a bit longer than other schools that have um, a single tier review process. Right, right. So they're, they're really reviewing quite a level of detail here. Yes, absolutely. So, of course, the numbers play a big role, but when it comes to the other parts of the application, what do you see as being most impactful? Is it oftentimes the personal statement after the LSAT score and the GPA? Um, so we really try to use a holistic review and because so many different people with different perspectives look at an application, every part really becomes important. So for example, our faculty are of course very interested to see how an applicant performs academically. What courses did they take? Um, how did they perform in those courses? Um, did they perhaps, were they a student that got a slow start in, in college and then improved over time? Um, all of those things, the letters of recommendation that are from uh, fellow academics, those are very influential for them. Um, our students, we have two students on the committee every year, they're particularly protective of the community here and so they really look at the fit piece. Um, they will read the personal statements very carefully, get a sense of what the students, this applicant's perspective is. Um, they have a very, it's a little bit easier for them to imagine and, and think um, in a real sense about what would it be like for this person to be sitting in the classroom. Um, they, uh, for us in admissions, because we see thousands of files year after year, we meet folks on the road, we see applicants who come, um, you know, we see them as just an application, then they come here and they are students here, we see that um, year after year and we have a, a broader perspective. Um, I think the combination means that every part is important. Um, certainly quantitative profile is important. It's an academic program. We're trying to assess aptitude for success, but um, it, as important as GPA and LSAT are, uh, so too is personal statement, so too are letters of recommendation, um, resume, which lets us know a little bit more about what an applicant, uh, what their interests and passions are, because those are all um, important pieces of the puzzle for us. Sure, sure. When it comes to the personal statement, are there any particular standout examples of successful personal statements or not so successful, just to kind of illustrate for folks the good and the bad? Yeah, so I would say the commonalities um, for strong personal statements, I would say they're uh, well-written, so not just you know grammatically correct, but there's a, a clear voice, a clear style. Um, the writing is sophisticated, not pretentious, but is, is sophisticated. They can um, write a, a compelling uh, a compelling story for us. Um, they're sincere. And so by that, I mean, um, you can really tell that someone is describing their own experiences, their own persp perspectives in their own voice. Um, and that's definitely challenging. Um, I realize that seems like a simple thing to, to instruct, um, but it's hard to achieve. Uh, but the really the strong ones have run the gamut in terms of topic, tone, um, whatever your personality is, it's fine to inject it into your personal statement as long as you really speak, um, you know, speak your truth, <laughs> uh, use your own voice. 
place and make sure it's your very best piece of writing. Um, I think the the ones who are less success, successful are uh, commonly things that um, we see where an applicant might draw inspiration from someone in their life. And so they spend a lot of the statement talking about that person. Um, and that's great. We want to have some context to understand why that person is influential. But if the whole statement is about that person and not the applicant, we haven't really learned very much about the person who wants to join our community. Um, so you have to kind of weigh that balance carefully. Um, of course, certainly anything that's not well written, that hasn't been proofread, um, that hasn't gone through multiple layers of review, that's going to stick out like a sore thumb. Um, I think the other thing I will say sometimes is people spend, um, we, our prompt is general, so I just ask that uh, applicants share something about themselves. Um, we don't ask them to write a why UC Davis specific uh, statement. So on occasion I will see applicants who will write most of their statement about our programs, our faculty, um, describing all of those things that I actually, I already know those things, um, I don't know the applicants. So um, it's great to express interest in our programs, but it's really important to connect it and to primarily focus on your interest as an applicant, your experiences really kind of tie it together. Uh, because I, I, I do know a lot about the school, and so I'm really looking for, for an applicant to educate me about themselves, not so much my school. Right, right. I would imagine the applicants might feel like they're showing they've done the homework and done the research, but these things are all on the website. It's not, you know, not particularly right. impressive to have just Googled <laughs> and found it. Yeah, absolutely. We assume you're interested if you decided to go through the trouble of applying. So yeah, <laughs> fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. What about the, uh, the character and fitness statements? Are there any common mistakes you see there or anything in particular that you're looking for in a character and fitness statement? Um, so I would say in general, I advise applicants to err on the side of disclosure. Um, it, it's also completely appropriate and encouraged to contact us if an applicant has questions about whether or not um, uh, an incident is responsive to the sanctions questions. Um, we ask about all the standard things, you know, legal sanctions. Um, we ask about academic issues. Uh, we also ask about employment issues, but that's that there are a lot of things that fall on that scale. Um, so I encourage folks to just give us a call if they have any questions and generally to err on the side of disclosure. Um, there are very few things that will immediately, uh, you know, if the applicant is to disclose it, that will immediately discount them from consideration. Um, generally speaking, sanctions, we're going to look at them in the context of the whole application. Um, specifically, we'll look at things like, is this a repeat occurrence? Um, everybody makes mistakes. Sometimes it's an isolated one-time thing, but if it's a pattern, um, sometimes that can be of more concern. Um, we look at how recent the incident was. If you have been out of college for 10 years and, you know, you made a mistake and had a housing violation or something your sophomore year of college, that's not of uh, significant concern to us. Um, and then the severity, right? So if you have criminal sanction issues, um, you know, really significant, serious, um, you know, felony type convictions um, are going to be viewed a bit differently than, you know, a speeding ticket, let's say. Um, but it's all in a continuum. I, I've, I've never had the situation where we've decided to just discount an applicant entirely based on their answer to a sanctions question alone. Um, the reason I do say to disclose, at least in California, where most of our graduates take the bar, um, they spend a lot of time in the character and fitness process of uh, looking at past disclosures. And so if there's something that you have to disclose for the bar um, and you didn't disclose it on your application, you can cure it later, but it's better to just disclose it from the outset uh, so that your application for law school admission mimics what's disclosed in your uh, bar application. Right, right. You can save yourself a lot of stress down the line yeah. if you just answer things fully this time around. Absolutely. Well, thanks for that, Kristen. So to shift gears a little bit, I wanted to t touch on some of these recent changes happening in law school admissions with the LSAT in particular in the past year or so. One of the biggest changes, I think, is that the LSAT is being offered far more frequently now than it used to be. It used to be only four times a year. Now it's nine times a year or 10 times a year. And I'm wondering, with the increased opportunities to retake the LSAT, will that change how your office views applicants with multiple LSAT takes? Um, you know, since we haven't had the first digital administration yet, and we're still even still even just adjusting to the LSAT being offered more than four times a year, um, it's a little bit, it's probably a little bit premature for me to um, give a really concrete answer, but I would say in general, you know, folks take the LSAT multiple times 
nowadays. That's very common to see people who take it two or three times. Um, you know, after this July test, everyone will be taking it digital. Um, so it, there's not sort of that difference that we're even thinking about. I mean, I think like any test, um, like any standardized test, there are folks who do well on standardized tests and folks who don't. And for some people, it's not a great predictor. I think the fact that it's going digital isn't gonna change that piece of the puzzle for us. Um, I do think that for, it's probably a bigger change for test takers because the format is different, right? Um, you're not, you're taking out a tablet instead of paper. Um, so until that, is a transition that is you know, a little bit further along in the process and people are just very used to doing that. Um, I can imagine how the study and the preparation process might be a little bit more challenging at the outset. Um, if, I guess if we see a huge change in terms of how folks are doing from say, a test administration that was paper um, to now a score that came from a digital test, I might be able to, uh, you know, I might have a different perspective on whether or not that really makes a difference. But um, my sense is as long as you do the preparation in terms of actually, you know, trying to take the test on a computer or on a tablet, um, that it won't, it won't change, performance shouldn't change um, just based on that, that change in format. Um, or at least that's, that's the design and what I would expect to see. Um, like any new, you know, new, new uh, change in, in standardized testing, it's possible that there could be sort of a, um, a difference in that first one or two go around with digital tests. But um, I don't expect to see a huge difference um, come this, you know, this first test administration where, where we're really seeing a large number of folks who are taking it digitally. Yeah, LSAC is working very hard. And as you know, yeah. just like I do, they're very precise in how they go about things. They're very scientific about it. They want to make sure yes. that the results are comparable. Yes, absolutely. And I would, you know, they're trying to make as much of the format accessible to people for free. Um, so going on their website, they have some sample tests you can take online so you can take advantage of um, the features they've added that make it mimic the paper test taking experience a bit more, like being able to cross out you know, quite ask answers as you're progressing through, flagging ones to go back to, um, that type of thing. Uh, so I encourage people to really kind of go to the LSAC website, take advantage of those free tests and those simulations that they offer just so that on the test date, you're as comfortable as you can be with a new format, um, especially if you've taken it previously on the old format, because uh, then it will, it, it will feel like a bigger change for you than someone who's coming in never having taken it um, any other way. Yeah, definitely. And for anyone who's wondering where to do that, it's at familiar.lsac.org. They've got all the interactive features on there with so far three different exams and they'll have more down the line. They'll be adding more onto that site. I do have one other question, Kristen, related to the, these policy changes, which is that on the July LSAT, LSAC is as a one-time freebie, letting applicants see their scores before they decide whether to cancel. And I think that may lead to a disproportionate number of cancellations on the July LSAT because people can see their scores beforehand, so they're taking it more, more kind of willingly, and they also get a free retake if they do cancel. So there's this incentive to cancel that usually is not there. And so I'm wondering how your office typically looks at a single LSAT cancellation and how they may look at cancellations going forward this year, given that July will likely have a disproportionately high number of them. Um, so, I mean, generally I will say cancellations, um, it, it happens and I, I, and I, I mean, only the test taker knows what exactly was happening that day and whether or not they think, um, circumstances are such that their performance was really adversely affected. Uh, I usually tell people if you studied and you felt reasonably comfortable in the test, um, you weren't sick, you didn't, you know, get only a couple hours sleep the night before, I would think carefully about canceling because you probably, um, you know, your sense of uh, impending failure is probably disproportionate to the reality. Um, that being said, you know, certainly with these July test takers, being able to actually see the score is a very different thing. Um, I think probably, you know, whether or not someone cancels, I do expect that there will probably be more cancels for July test takers, um, just because there is that option. Um, it's not a, there's not a negative, um, mark in, in having a cancellation. Um, I do, I think sometimes if people have multiple cancellations um, and they've tried to take, you know, they've registered for seven LSATs, they've canceled three times, they've, you know, no-showed for one, then I kind of wonder if someone's organized and prepared for actually starting law school. But a single cancellation in and of itself it's not it's not of concern and certainly with it being such a ready option for the July test I wouldn't I wouldn't view that any differently 
um, than any other cancellation. And in fact, I would probably understand a bit more why someone might be inclined to cancel, um, given that they they actually it's, it's a different scenario um, in the cancellation context than usually what people have. You have a very important piece of information uh, that normally you wouldn't have. So I would understand if people cancel then. Um, July is not a bad test date to cancel because you still have a lot of time to take the test again before the application cycle. So I would understand that as well. Um, it's not going to adversely impact our evaluation, um, a cancellation for that one. Oh, it's great to hear. I can feel everybody's stress levels just plummeting once they hear this. They don't have to worry too much about it. You yeah. know, listening and keeping track of what's happening with LSAC. That's good to hear. Well, one more, one more question before we sign off, which is about the GRE. Is UC Davis taking the GRE and what's your, what's your take on that? Yeah, so we took the GRE for the first time this cycle, this past cycle. Um, it, it's definitely something our faculty, um, and, and I think generally we wanted, we approached it with sort of an open mind and a bit of a, this is an experiment, let's see what, what comes, uh, comes of it. Um, you know, there were some data that ETS did, you know, looking at actual school data, but until we actually saw students come into the law school, perform, um, you know, it's a little, it still a little, it feels a little speculative to us. So um, I think seeing who, you know, how many students we have in the class, how they perform this, this upcoming academic year really, will really be informative as to whether or not we continue to accept it going forward. Um, it's a standardized test. It has a certain role in, you know, determining someone's aptitude for graduate study. It's a little bit different than the LSAT, but many of the skill sets that it tests are similar, um, similar enough that we felt comfortable using it. Um, I don't expect to see a huge difference in academic performance for a GRE-only uh, applicant versus an LSAT applicant. Um, I mean, and we'll, we'll see how they, how they perform. Um, I will say it was a very small portion of our pool and is very likely to be a very small percentage of our incoming class this fall, I would say. Uh, less than 5%, um, probably quite a bit, <laughs> to be honest, probably quite a bit less than 5%. We'll see um, come August. But um, so I don't, I don't think there's going to be a huge data pool um, for coming out of this first cycle of accepting and then actually seeing a, a matriculating class that includes some of those folks. Um, you know, there were benefits to doing it. We saw a lot of people with graduate degrees in other disciplines, which is always nice to have that academic diversity. But in terms of using it as a tool for predicting, um, you know, success in law school, I, I, for us, we found it to be just as helpful um, as the LSAT. It had as just as many drawbacks as advantages as any standardized test, frankly. So um, we relied heavily on all the other parts of the application as well, just as we do with um, LSAT applicants. So that was how the process worked for us this year. Interesting. So not a huge game changer necessarily, but still opened the door to some folks with unique backgrounds. Yeah, you know, and I saw, I could see how, you know, someone who's already been through graduate school is perhaps already working in another field and is wanting to now pivot their professional interests, not having to go through another standardized test, especially when we can already see that they have um, been successful with graduate study and another career path. I'm happy to, you know, remove that barrier. It's not quite as... Um, it's not the same concern for us, maybe. Um, and we like to, if that is something that can kind of encourage folks with lots of different expertise uh, to consider law school, then for me, that's a win-win because we really appreciate that academic um, diversity in our classes. Awesome, Kristen. Well, this has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate you taking the time. Sure. Before we sign off, do you want to share a little bit about UC Davis for applicants who might be interested in the best way to, of course, get in touch with you? Yeah, so our website is always the best way to get in touch with us. Um, our website is uh, law.ucdavis.edu, um, and you can find admissions right there on the top of the homepage. Um, I, my contact information is on there on our contact us section, so you're welcome to contact me or any member of my team. Um, you know, Davis, most people don't know where Davis is, so I'll just tell you right off the bat, it's right in the middle of Northern California. We're about 20 minutes from Sacramento, which is the state capital. Um, Davis is a great, picturesque college town, very green, um, very easy place to live, um, but we're so close to a really interesting uh, state capital. California has a very dynamic, uh, very uh, progressive legislature that is pushing the, you know, pushing the front lines on lots of different types of policy, immigration, education, environmental policy. So there's a really interesting real world um, uh, 
uh, real world experience available to our students that's unique. You're still close to San Francisco, um, access to you know major legal markets across the country, but your day to day experience is very easy. Um, small law school, you can study lots of different things, um, but I think the important thing that a lot of our students feel is that they are actually an individual um, who is known. People know who you are, they know what your interests are, they support you. Um, so whether that's faculty, it's someone in career services who knows you have a passion for a particular area, an opportunity arises and they can say, hey, I have the I have the great person for you, and email that student and say, hey, send me your resume, there's this perfect opportunity um, for you. Um, we're a very diverse law school as well. We have more than half of our entering classes are students of color. 20 to 30 percent of our entering last three entering classes were the first generation in their family to graduate from college. Um, we have a majority minority faculty, which is exceedingly rare for a, a top 40 law school, um, half women. Um, so we really kind of value folks for and, and define diversity broadly and encourage that in the classroom and you know in our faculty and our student body um, and I think that translates um, to really having a, a dynamic and really rich academic experience for our students and and really sets them off to be successful in a world where um, you know we really strive and I think as a legal profession want to be as diverse as the communities we serve. Um, and so we really feel it's important to kind of start that here in our own halls, um, preparing lawyers for the next, you know, for the future. Um, and I think there's, you know, there's an ability to kind of feel part of a community and still be able to really access great opportunities and, and excel and achieve great things for yourself. Um, while still feeling like you have folks who are supporting you and really encouraging you and, and wanting to see you be successful as much as they want to see, you know, achieve successes for themselves. Awesome. Well, definitely encourage folks to check out UC Davis Law. Great. Thank you again for taking the time and sharing your advice with everyone. Really appreciate it. Great. Thank you.